Thank you very much, Jesse. And uh, I want to extend a sort of broader thank you to all of you for attending the panel today. So, uh, as Jesse said, my paper is entitled, I Hate the More Internalized Racism in Two Contemporary Othello Adaptations. I titled this presentation with a line that Iago says twice, I hate the more. But I'd like to pose a thought experiment. What if, instead of Iago, we imagine the line spoken by Othello himself? While William Shakespeare's Othello has any number of speakers using what we would today call racist language and stereotypes about the Moorish titular character, I would argue that Othello himself also reflects internalized racism. By internalized racism, I mean that Othello has adopted racially biased attitudes about his own ethnic group, and that he applies those attitudes to himself in the probably unconscious service of preserving the white or European supremacy ideologically imbued in his adopted Venetian culture. As we'll see momentarily, this is not merely an idle thought. The, there actually is some evidence that Othello equates his ethnicity with evil. However, the main focus of this presentation is on the reception of Othello by contemporary playwrights, specifically the Afro-Canadian playwrights Janet Sears and Joseph Jomo Pierre. Both Sears' 1997 play Harlem Duet and Pierre's 2013 Shakespeare's N, and that's not the full title of Pierre's play, but uh, because it is an ethnic slur, I'm not going to say the full title. Uh, both plays depict an Othello whose identification with whiteness undermines the solidarity and legitimacy of black communities. In each case, Othello's desire to be or be seen as white, most obviously represented by his love of white women, destroys black solidarities, and it's only when his internalized racism, racism is excised that liberated and supportive communities can emerge. Both Sears and Pierre play up Othello's ambivalence about his ethnicity, but to what extent is this grounded in the Shakespearean source? As we'll see, both of the modern adapters make Othello's love for a white woman central to his internalized racism, but in the Shakespeare, Othello's love for Desdemona isn't necessarily a desire to escape his blackness. However, some overt references tell us Othello has internalized negative stereotypes. In 3.3, Othello says he cannot speak eloquently because he is black, and later he claims that because of his distrust, my name that was as fresh as Diane's visage is now begrimed and black as mine own face. But the most overt expression of internalized racism comes in Othello's suicide speech at the end of the play. He compares himself to a foolish Indian who throws away a pearl of great value, to an Arabian tree weeping gum, and to a Turk Othello had once killed in Aleppo for attacking a Venetian. All of these comparisons connect Othello to the exotic non-European or non-white, but the last reference to the Turk is the most revealing. Othello begins the simile being the one who attacks the Turk, who, is, uh, who are again the major enemies of the Venetians in the play, but he ends the simile by being stabbed in the Turk's place. The anecdote positions him, Othello himself as the non-European other who violently attacks the innocent European and must therefore be destroyed. In other words, this final speech suggests that Othello sees himself as the dangerous outsider, never fully capable of integrating as an equal in Venice, no matter how much good service he does the state. Othello's desperation to integrate into white society becomes central in Sears' Harlem duet, which dramatizes both Othello's desire to be seen as white and the negative psychological impact this desire has on his African-American wife, Billy, whom Othello abandons for the white Desdemona. The play is divided between three different time periods, the South in the 1860s, Harlem in the 1920s, and contemporary, i.e. 1990s, Harlem. In each time period, Othello abandons Billy for a version of Desdemona, breaking Billy's heart and severely damaging her psyche. Throughout the play, there are instances of what Daniel Fishlin and Marc Fortier characterize as Othello's over-eager desire to pass in white culture. Othello identifies himself with the dominant, i.e. white Euro-American society. He even tells Billy, I'm not a minority. I used to be a minority when, a kid, when I was a kid. I mean, my culture is not my mother's culture, the culture of my ancestors. My culture is Wordsworth, Shaw, Leave it to Beaver, Dirty Harry. 
I drink the same water, read the same books. What's striking here is the focus on transformation. Othello has not always identified with white culture, but, now, but he does now that he's achieved a measure of professional success as a professor at Columbia. The idea of transformation, of becoming a member of the white establishment, is thematically central to Othello's character in Harlem Duet. It's perhaps stated most overtly in the 1860s storyline. Billy recounts a story about a black man who wanted to become white and was told by a psychic he would have to enter the whiteness, which he did by having sex with a white woman. During this sex, Billy says, for a single shivering moment he became her, her and her whiteness. Now, although Billy tells this story rather than Othello expressing it as his own desire, it correlates with Othello abandoning Billy for Desdemona. The play links this internalized racism with his sexuality, and the internalized racism has a major negative impact on Billy. Billy reflects the values of community and family, and her psychological degeneration over the course of Harlem Duet reflects the destructive impact of Othello's internalized racism. From Act 1, Scene 1, we learn that Billy has been cripplingly depressed since Othello left her. The landlord Maggie describes her as stillness itself, buried under that ocean of self-help books like it's a tomb, like a pyramid over her, over the bed. Much of the early portion of the play is taken up by Billy's self-destructive sadness. This depression is clearly tied to Othello's relationship with Desdemona. Not just that Othello has left Billy, but specifically that he's left her for a white woman. Billy actually describes having what sounds like an anxiety attack upon seeing a couple she took to be Othello and Desdemona in the subway. Billy describes the couple's pride in one another. He's proud. You can see he's proud. He isn't just any Negro. He's special. That's why she's with him. And she... she... she flaunts. Yes, she flaunts. Billy's physical symptoms are tied to this perception that Othello feels he's special because he's romantically involved with a white woman. Beyond the physical and psychological impacts the breakup has on Billy, Othello abandoning her also symbolizes a degeneration of the African-American family. In the 1860 storyline, Billy and Othello plan to have four boys and four girls as part of their dream of an ideal life. Family represents stability, support, and connections. However, in the modern storyline, we learn that Billy has had two miscarriages, and her relationship with her own father is strained because he was an alcoholic who abandoned the family. While neither of these things are necessarily Othello's fault, his marriage to Billy represented the potential to build a new family, a new community. Their relationship and desire for a family was also linked to the larger struggle for racial unity because they met as activists promoting and supporting African American and pan-black rights. So by betraying Billy, Othello not only betrays her, but their family and their race. A similar betrayal occurs in, Shakespeare, in Pierre's Shakespeare's N, where Othello turns on his fellow slave Aaron to protect the slave-owning Shakespeare's interests. In Pierre's play, Shakespeare and his daughter Judith are slave owners who own Othello, Aaron from Titus Andronicus, an older slave, and an older slave named Tyrus, along with many others. The divisions between the obedient Othello and the rebellious Aaron are apparent from scene two, in which Othello, under Shakespeare's guidance, whips his fellow slave for trying to escape. In response to Aaron's defiance, Othello takes it upon himself to whip Aaron more viciously before Shakespeare stops him, quoting his own Henry VIII. Heat not a furnace for your foe so hot that it do singe yourself, Othello. We are here to send a message to Aaron. Do not make it personal. Othello here exceeds the role of the slaver, being more vicious in punishing the runaway than Shakespeare himself. This whipping reflects Othello's internalized racism when he later whips his horse in a scene paralleling the punishment of Aaron. Othello is trying to tame a new horse, and the horse's stubbornness mirrors Aaron's defiance in the earlier scene. As he threatens the horse with the whip, Othello mocks him. That unruly nature, expose it now. That iron will, bear it now and he cracks the whip. The horse's independence enrages Othello, who sees echoes of Aaron in the horse. But beyond Aaron, Othello also sees himself reflected in the horse. He asks, who told you that the roles were to be reversed? And tells the animal, in faith I can be as unbridled as you. 
Othello takes on the characteristics of the horse, equating both their roles in a hierarchical power structure and their attributes, specifically their unbridledness. In identifying both himself and Aaron with the horse, Othello plays into centuries of stereotypes associating people of African descent as bestial or subhuman. This idea also ostensibly justifies Othello's role in punishing Aaron, because if the horse that stands in for the black man deserves to be whipped, then so does Aaron, and by extension, so does Othello. Othello's attitude reflects his upbringing as a house slave and companion to Shakespeare absorbing many of his master's thoughts, life lessons, and even hobbies like writing and painting. Because Shakespeare treats him more or less as an equal, Othello acts on his unreciprocated love for Judith by asking for her hand in marriage. And it shouldn't shock any of you to learn that Shakespeare rejects this uh, offer because Othello is black. For Shakespeare, the racial difference is absolute. However, this absolute difference is complicated when we learn of Othello's parentage both because it reveals Shakespeare's hypocrisy, which was a common hypocrisy among slave owners, and because it debatably legitimizes Othello's identification with white society. When Othello discovers that Judith has given birth to Aaron's baby after a lengthy love affair, he threatens to kill Aaron, who reveals that Judith is Othello's sister. Tyrus tells the incredulous Othello that Shakespeare was his father and the dark lady of the sonnet sequence, a slave, was his mother. As Shakespeare's son, Othello's sense of belonging to the white world is not entirely without foundation, though in U.S. race-based slavery, the children of white owners and black slaves were born into slavery and considered black. Othello's self-hatred is ultimately symbolized in his death. After Othello attempts to stab Judith, Aaron wrestles him to the ground and places the dagger against Othello's chest. Othello seizes Aaron's wrists and plunges the knife into himself simultaneously killing himself and bloodying Aaron's hands. But as Othello kills himself, that liberates Aaron to lead a slave revolt against Shakespeare. Earlier in the play, we saw Aaron plotting a liberatory, though extremely violent, uprising to free not only himself, but all other slaves. He tells a group of Shakespeare's slaves, When the time calls, we will head to the house and kill all who are complicit without remorse. Then we will move to the next. We will do this until all our people are free. Recognizing the Manichaean structure of slavery, Aaron believes systemic violence by one group against another demands equal violence by the oppressed group for liberation. And it is Othello's death that sparks the uprising. Aaron instructs Tyrus, There's no turning back, Tyrus. The blood has begun to flow. Get the others ready. The obvious literal interpretation here is that Othello is the first complicit person to be killed in the slave revolt, which sets the stage for the violence to come. However, Othello also represents internalized racism, and it's only when that internalized racism is eliminated that liberation becomes possible. And when Aaron and Tyrus confront Shakespeare in the final scene during the slave revolt, they do so without fear of the slave owner. In Harlem Duet, Sears similarly opens up possibilities for healing once Othello is out of Billy's life. Despite, or even because of Billy being sent to the psychiatric hospital at the end of the play, Sears hints at the rebuilding of both family and a larger community support network. In the final scene, the rebuilding of Billy's support system really begins. Now, the scene opens with Billy in the, ho in the visitor's lounge of the hospital singing and dancing with Ama who's Othello's sister and one of Billy's best friends. Ama checks on Billy's condition before heading out, meeting Canada, Billy's father, on his way to visit. Billy and Canada began a tentative reconciliation earlier in the play, and Ama tells Canada everyone will miss him when he returns home to Nova Scotia. But, he says, Oh, I don't think I'm going anywhere just yet, least if I can help it. Way too much leaving going on for one lifetime already. The play ends with Billy and Canada picking up the song she had been singing with Ama. In addition to Canada's determination to, uh, to stay with his daughter, the singing signifies the rebuilding of a community around Billy. Throughout Sears' play, music and sound recordings are used for scene transitions and background, drawing from a range of African-American styles, particularly Delta blues and different styles of jazz, paired with speeches from people like Martin Luther King Jr., or Malcolm X. 
Throughout Harlem Duet, music reflects African-American tradition, identity, and pride, and this is precisely the restorative role of the duets Billy sings with Ma and Canada in the hospital. The restorative or liberatory role of expression also comes at the end of Pierre's play, raising larger questions about the ongoing role of Shakespeare's Othello in patterning race relations and black self-identity. During the revolt to sleep, Free the Slaves, Aaron confronts Shakespeare as a character from Titus Andronicus, demanding to know why Shakespeare wrote him as a villain. Shakespeare claims that it was Aaron's part to play, and Aaron asserts, no, no, it was the part you would have me play. This was my part. Had my tongue not been tied, you would have known. This final liberatory gesture is Aaron's demand to control his own story, not merely to play the part written for him by the white author. Both Pierre and Sears challenge Shakespeare's Othello, raising questions about whether black communities need to reject the authority of Shakespeare's play in defining black identities. Does the Bard's canonical influence continue to shape negative stereotypes of black people, including amongst black people themselves? Can and should Shakespeare's more be exercised from the popular consciousness? Or can black authors take charge of the narrative by re-envisioning Othello? Unfortunately, this presentation is only going to raise these questions, not attempt to answer them. Thank you.